This is part three of the story of Daniel Mendoza. I should start by apologising that it's taken quite so long to get to part three. Uh, when I checked back, it seemed that it's been coming up to two years since I recorded part two. So for that, I apologise. But we got here in the end. Let's hope uh, part three and any other subsequent parts don't take quite so long. So let's summarise where we got to. Dan was about 19 years old. He'd been trying very hard to become a man of business. He'd had several jobs, most of which he'd lost through fighting. Uh, he'd set up his own business and that had failed. He'd developed quite a reputation as a fighter and he'd been taken under the wing of a very successful fighter and trainer by the name of Richard Humphreys. That's a name we're going to encounter several times throughout the story of Daniel Mendoza. Uh, later on, the two of them became great rivals. But I won't spoil it any more than that by giving the game away just yet. The business in Northampton hadn't proved to be successful, and Dan had moved back to London. And while he was there, he took a fight against a professional fighter by the name of Tom Tyne. And they agreed to fight for five guineas a side. Not a large amount of money, but for someone of Dan's means, uh, not an inconsiderable sum. Tyne was two years older than Mendoza, uh, a large, strong man who'd already developed quite a reputation as a successful pugilist. Uh, the two met in Leightonstone, in Essex, and they fought for an hour and a quarter. And in the end, Dan's friends refused to let him fight, so Dan lost the fight. It was a, a hard-fought match all the same, though. Um, it certainly wasn't an easy win for Tyne, and he suffered quite a lot from the effects of the fight. Dan was, was fairly convinced that the only reason he'd won was because Tyne was older than him, and that because they were both quite young, that those two years made a fairly significant difference. And he firmly believed that if he fought him again later, he would win. We'll come to that shortly. By this time, Dan was pretty much established as a professional fighter. Humphreys was still in touch and Dan was being trained by Humphreys and Humphreys seconded him in some of his major fights. Uh, the next fight he had was at Kilburn Wells against a man by the name of Matthews. It wasn't a big fight, it was only for six guineas a side, so another relatively small one. Um, but Daniel won that one fairly conclusively. There were a number of the fancy present at this fight, some people of eminence within the realm, and among them was none other than the Prince of Wales himself. And Dan met the Prince of Wales after the fight, and they persuaded him to take a fight against a very famous pugilist by the name of Martin the Bath Butcher. The fight against Martin went on for two and a half hours, not out of any great skill on Martin's part. Um, he knew he was outclassed and he had started to take a knee. Um, effectively, he would fall to the ground to end the round whenever he felt that Mendoza was getting the advantage. And the fight dragged on an awfully long time. The public watching were getting quite cross, and so was Mendoza. So instead of you doing his usual trick of standing off and counter-punching, uh, Mendoza was very agile, he was considered to be massively scientific, even at this point in his career. He decided to throw caution to the wind, and the second the opportunity arose, he closed in on Martin, took a grip with him, and refused to let him fall, and effectively just beat him bloody until, when he went down, he stayed down. And that was one of the biggest wins of Mendoza's career to date. That was for the grand sum of 20 guineas. One of the recurring themes of Mendoza's life is that he constantly got into trouble. 
and um, that didn't change. He was walking through the neighbourhood of St Catherine's when he came across two women fighting in the street. These were not times where equality was considered to be uh, um, the norm. So Dan, who didn't like women fighting, a lot of people did, and fights between women had been put on but weren't, weren't really anywhere near as popular as fights between men. Um, so Dan decided that he'd, he'd break them up and he'd stop the fight. However, he struggled. Um, he did manage to separate them, but the two of them were so angry with each other and so hell-bent on fighting that in the end, Mendoza let them go and, and, and actually put a bet on one of them. There was a sailor passing who took his bet and the two of them effectively then became seconds for the women as they fought. The woman that Dan had bet upon won the fight, but instead of giving the money to Dan as, as they should have done, the sailor challenged Dan to a fight immediately so he didn't have to pay him. Um, as you would expect, Mendoza thrashed him fairly soundly. Uh, the sailor went back to his ship and uh, shortly afterwards came back with 20 to 30 of his crewmen to find Dan to revenge the thrashing he'd been given. Thankfully, they didn't manage to find him. A few days later, hearing of this, Dan's cousin challenged any of the sailors to come and fight him one-on-one. -on -one. And the sailor that Dan had fought with took him up on this. Dan, being the, the man he was, decided to go and second his cousin. Uh, he turned up at the fight, and as you might expect, it didn't quite go according to plan. They got about two rounds in before the ring was effectively ripped apart by the crowd and a full-blown riot erupted. At this point, the large numbers of sailors did manage to get their hands on Dan and his cousin and gave them a bit of a beating with bludgeons and cudgels. In Dan's own words, he believes that the sailors only stopped when they thought they'd killed him, for he was unable to move and unable to speak. And after everyone had left, it took him quite a long time before he was able to get back to his feet and get away and get back home. A few months later, Dan took insult at uh, something a man by the name of Dennis said to him and challenged him to a fight. Dennis took it up. Uh, they were only to fight for a guinea. It was more about pride. They fought at Locks Fields on the Kent Road and very early in the fight Dan fell and sprained his ankle quite badly. He didn't let that stop him though. Uh, he, he won soundly within about half an hour. Turned out that the ankle injury was a little bit more serious than he'd originally thought and it put him out of action for some three to four months. Thankfully, by this time, he'd developed a bit of a following among the fancy and they made sure that he was alright, they, they gave him enough money to live on and looked after him and made sure that he recovered very nicely. By the time he'd recovered he was very keen to fight again. Um, partly because that was his nature, and partly to repay the, the kindness that his backers had, had shown him. He took a fight against a spring maker by the name of Brian at Islington. The fight again didn't last very long, only half an hour. Brian was strong, but wasn't particularly skilled. But because they'd fought so close to the centre of London, a lot of people were present, quite a crowd gathered, including a number of gentlemen of eminence. It was now that Mendoza felt that he'd improved enough and recovered enough to challenge Tom Tyne to a second fight. However, another fight came Dan's way before the rematch with Tyne was able to take place. He was challenged by a, a famous and successful pugilist by the name of Nelson. Nelson was famously strong and successful and had been the victor in several very hard battles, to the point where people were offering odds of 10 to 1 on Daniel winning. Hearing of this, Mr Elwood, a friend of, of Richard Humphreys, took Dan under his wing. Dan had never really trained for a fight before, so this was a new experience to him. And he'd been at the building that Elwood had, had provided for a few days when he realised that this was actually a brothel. He took offence at this. It was something he considered beneath him and he was not happy at all at being made to train there, so he refused. He walked away, he left, and fell out fairly significantly with Elwood at this point. This caused the beginnings of a rift between Mendoza and Humphreys, and Elwood withdrew his stake and his backing of Mendoza for the fight, but Dan 
was determined that Nelson wasn't going to be able to say that Dan had withdrawn because Dan was very much willing to fight him. Nelson was seconded by the great Tom Johnson, who was a friend and training partner. Nelson had announced that he needed no second, he could beat Dan handsomely without. However, after an hour and a quarter of fighting, that proved not to be the case. Dan emerged the victor. At this point, Dan was firmly established as a successful pugilist with quite a fearsome reputation. And he challenged time again, and the two of them met in Croydon for the sum of 20 guineas a side. This fight was as one-sided as the first fight had been close, and after an hour of Tyne effectively running away and trying to avoid Mendoza, he simply gave in. The next fight, however, was something quite special. But we're going to leave it for now because, well, we can't go on all night, much as we'd love to. So keep your eyes open for Daniel Mendoza's Stories of Greatness, part four. If you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button and there's a little bell that pops up. If you click that, you'll get notifications so that when I release another video, you'll find out. I've just restarted my Patreon, which has been dormant for, for over a year. Um, if you're able to offer me any support on Patreon, then that would be fantastic. Anything from, from a dollar a month or a dollar a video up, hugely appreciated. It allows me to spend more time and make nicer, more professional videos, and let's be honest, more of them. So click like, stick something in the comments, and I'll see you soon. Take care.